Hi, I'm Tim Kildeff, and this is Business Matters. Business Matters is HCAM's show focusing not only on businesses in Hopkinton, but more importantly, the people who run and manage these businesses. Today, I have with me Greg Menis and Jim Vallis, co-founders and owners of Blackstone Valley Wealth Management in Hopkinton. Gentlemen, thanks for taking the time to join us here at, here at HCAM. Thank you. We want, to, we want to spend some time talking about your individual backgrounds, but I think to put it in perspective, it might be helpful to start with a description of the company, and then we can, we can backfill. Sure, sure, Tim. Thank you. Thanks for having us here today. Um, so we, uh, we run Blackstone Wealth Management located here in Hopkinton at Hopkinton Square and uh, came into a town in March of 2013. Greg and I are both certified financial planners and uh, we provide financial planning and comprehensive wealth management services to individuals, business owners, nonprofit organizations, and trusts. Uh, how did you two meet? Uh, good question. Uh, Jim and I, I were fortunate enough to work together for about 10 years at a large financial firm. Uh, we started working together in the, the Worcester area in one of the firm's satellite offices and then worked together uh, very closely for the past five years uh, right in the Framingham Natick area. I uh, went through your, your educational backgrounds. They're, they're a little different. Uh, why don't you share with us a little bit about your uh, Formal training, your education. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, I took a, a fairly unique approach to get here. I come from a military family. Um, my my grandfather and father are both retired military, and um, as a young as a young man, I desired to uh, be a fighter pilot. It's going to go to the United States Air Force Academy. I grew up in Worcester. I ended up going to WPI in Worcester to play sports and go through their Air Force program. And very early in my uh, educational career. I fell in love with personal finance. So I shifted gears and uh, completed my uh, education at, at WPI in business management and uh, went on into graduate school and then ultimately into, uh, into the workforce. You know, it's interesting because uh, WPI I, is known uh, in, in terms of uh, producing very high level engineers, computer scientists, that sort of thing. How did you end up there? I, I'm, I'm interested in that. Yeah, it's a great question, Tim. So um, I grew up in the Worcester area. I remember spending a lot of time on Shrewsbury Street in Worcester growing oh, up. Okay. And uh, still visit Shrewsbury Street to this day. And um, what, what intrigued me about WPI is uh, I could stay close to my family. They had an Air Force program that I was interested in. And one of the reasons I went there is that I could play sports at that level, get a great education, and initially go through the Air Force program and graduate as an officer. Wow. How about yeah, you? certainly a little different. Uh, no engineering in my family or, or, or background in, in these bones, but uh, I grew up in a very rural town in upstate New York, Catskill Mountains, a uh, small town outside of Woodstock, New York, which most people are familiar with. Right. And uh, I would say my greatest passions when I was younger was certainly sports, baseball in particular. And uh, when it came time to, to go to college, I focused more on where could I go to play baseball more so than the educational component. So I went off to Ithaca College, played baseball, and uh, once I graduated and realized I wasn't going to play professional baseball, I had to think about <laughs> what am I going to do for a career. And I me pretty much immediately transitioned to graduate school, uh, got my master's degree at a Springfield College, went to work in Manhattan as an exercise physiologist and did that for about a year and decided, well, maybe I want to go to medical school. Well, in order to go to medical school, there were some prerequisites that one needs to have to even apply. So I went to the University of Vermont to take those prerequisites, the good old organic chemistries and physics of the world, and, and met a, a woman who is now my wife and kind of altered all those plans. And uh, I got into the financial services industry in January of 1990 and uh, just grew to love what I do and uh, very fortunate to sit in the seat that I sit today. Do you get, do you get back to, uh, I'm familiar with Ithaca, my daughter oh, graduated yeah. from Ithaca. Do you get, do you get back there? Uh, I was back there a couple of years ago uh, doing the tour of colleges with my older daughter and uh, we looked at some schools out in Rochester and I said, well, we're out here, we have to go and look at Ithaca. Uh, right, right. Uh, but that was, you know, prior to that I hadn't been there in, in 20 years. So you start, both started out in very different tracks to where you ended up. Uh, 
kids that spend, and you just went through that process, I guess, with your daughter. Yes. The, the, what advice would you give, would you give uh, students when they're looking at, at, uh, at schools? There seems to be a lot of pressure on, on high school seniors nowadays to, to get on a, on a track. You guys took very different tracks to where, uh, c compared to where you ended up. Yeah, it's a great question, Tim. I think one of the challenges when you're, when you're that old is already knowing what your passion is um, and what you may want to do. So I think some of the things I had to think about was um, how close did I want to be to my family? Was that important to me? Or did I want to be further away? Um, what opportunities were available at that school? And what kind of flexibility did I have if I needed to switch areas? Yeah, I, having gone through the experience of having a daughter who's now a sophomore in college and another one who will be graduating in a couple of weeks and going off to college, my older daughter pretty much knew where she wanted to go. So she's a nursing major. Okay. Uh, All right. My younger daughter really doesn't know what area of career or vocation she wants to pursue. She'll be going to Holy Cross and will be uh, obtaining a liberal arts education. But it's really hard to know for, for many young adults where their, their passion is or what career path they want to choose. So if they can find a university or school that they really love or passionate about, and uh, they'll figure their way out over time. Yeah, that's, uh, I think you're probably right about that. Uh, when you're in the middle of it, though, uh, it's, uh, it's rather stressful. In terms of your day-to-day -day work, what do you spend your time doing? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's, it's quite busy. It's a lot. <laughs> a lot of different things. But. Uh, Greg and I often have early mornings, um, sometimes late nights, uh, but it's a combination of uh, managing our team in the office, uh, communicating with our clients, either face-to-face, -face, over the phone, uh, or electronically, uh, oftentimes talking with our client centers of influence as well, their attorneys, uh, their accountants. And, uh, and we often find ourselves uh, taking time outside the office and getting involved here in the local community as well. Do you? Yeah, we, we, sh we should talk about that. That's, uh, we here at HCAM think that that's uh, really important. Uh, and, and how about you? And, and you, know, you talk about the team in the office. Maybe What's the team look like? Is it, <laughs> just the two of you sitting well, right Yeah, here's 50% of it. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Uh, so, yes. So, uh, we have two additional... Uh, people that assist us, uh, Maureen, who we call the Director of First Impressions, handles all our operations, so she's answering the phone. She'll just, she's the, the face you'll see when you walk through our door and handles a lot of all of our, our paperwork. Uh, Susie uh, does a lot of our compliance, a lot of our marketing, social media. Uh, she does a lot with Constant Contact to ensure that uh, yeah. we're getting some pertinent information out to our clients and we do that every five to six weeks and uh, she does a lot with our schedules uh, as far as meeting with different uh, wholesalers and things of that nature. Where's the pressure? Where's the pressure? What's the pressure point? Uh, I wouldn't call it pressure mm. but I think uh, making sure we're touching our, our clients often enough. Uh, that's the, I think the one thing that keeps Jim and I up at night is making sure we can do everything we can for our clients and making sure we're communicating with them proactively. Uh, with, with the size operation you have, I'm assuming that means a pretty extensive network. It does. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so for what we do, or what we call wealth management, it, uh, it goes well beyond our clients' investments. It's helping them with their assets, their liabilities, their estate planning, their taxes their charitable planning, saving for college. So what Greg and I do is we start to build a network of other professionals that we can work with to help our clients solve problems. Um, could be mortgage professionals, banking professionals, um, college professionals who can help our clients' children uh, hopefully find their way into the college or university they're looking for. So we're always looking to grow and expand our network and ultimately that's all to help our clients uh, achieve their objectives. The, the um, you, you talked about uh, charitable uh, interests on the part of people. Are, do, do people, as as people now are starting to plan, do you see that uh, on the on the uptick? People that are really interested in the charitable side of their of their lives. 
I, I think when you start to see individuals or families acquire a certain level of net worth, uh, you tend to see the, those philanthropic uh, givers expand who they're giving to and how to give. Uh, we do a lot with educating our clients. It's very easy to say I'm going to contribute to a charity and write a check. Right. Uh, we look at a client's portfolio and oftentimes we find that they have what we call low basis securities, investments that have done well since the time they've purchased them. Well, it may be pr prudent to donate securities rather than cash. So Jim and I look at each of our clients' tax returns. It gives us a sense of what they're doing from a charitable perspective and then we can guide them as how to best give. It would, it would appear to me that you have to spend a lot of time on continuing education. How do you, how do, you do that? How do you, you, you're in multiple areas now. We do. So, so there's a variety of factors involved. Um, state securities licenses for everywhere. We have clients, Greg and I are licensed in, in several states. Insurance licenses uh, for any business that we conduct in that area. We're both uh, known as certified financial planners, so in addition to paying, paying fees <laughs> associated with that, we have to do continuing education there. And oftentimes, Tim, that is setting time aside throughout the year where we have to sit down and dedicate a half a day to just going through exams, reading, updates, or sometimes we have to go out outside the office and sit down every couple of years right. and retake exams to keep all of our license current and keep ourselves up to date on, on our uh, education requirements. How do you become a certified financial planner? Uh, good question. Uh, a couple different ways to do it, whether you want to sit down and take the six modules of classes through a, a university like BU or where Jim did it through Bryant University. You can do it online through the modules there, but there are six modules that you have to complete pass tests. And then in order to become a certified financial planner, there is a two-day, 10-hour exam that you must sit for. Uh, Friday is one part of the exam, which I believe encompasses four hours, and then on Saturday, six hours. Where's the, the, uh, that implies regulation to me. <laughs> uh, how much of what you do uh, is regulated? Yeah, it's a great question, Tim. I, I think the industry is it seems to be highly regulated and it's getting stricter Even. and I think um, Greg and I welcome that opportunity um, because in the end it's it's just about doing what's in the very best interest of our clients so um, so there are several types of regulations and compliance rules that we have to follow on a daily basis um, and Susie helps us quite a bit with that in the office are the regulations federal state I'm oh. assuming there's no. I, I'm assuming there's no local. <laughs> I'm not sure we want to start any, but both. no, it's both. Yeah, you have. Uh, you may be familiar with the Department of Labor, or the DOL, coming out with this uh, fiduciary standard versus a suitability standard. Uh, one of the things, as certified financial planners, uh, we operate under that fiduciary standard, which simply means we have to put the interests of our clients above all else. A suitability standard is much more liberal in that an investment or a security may be suitable but may not always be in the best interest of that, that individual or client. Uh, the fiduciary standard is the highest standard within the industry. We're proud to say we work under that standard and as a certified financial planner, uh, there's an ethics component to being a certified financial planner that you must follow and adhere to. The, the profession in general. The, the, the certified nature of what you do. Um, there are pe there are, the, 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 the news is filled with, with stories about, about people that are not. Um, professionally, how, what kind of role do you take in, uh, in, in, uh, in what role do you play in terms of your profession in advancing best practices? In terms of, um, in terms of with, our, with our peers or other people who do yeah, what I, we do? Yeah, both. Yeah. I, I think, well, from a best practice standpoint, uh, Greg and I often collaborate with each other, but then we also collaborate with our peers, other individuals who sit in a similar place that we do. They own, manage, and run their own business. And so we're often asking them, um, how are they handling certain example? how are they handling certain situations, compliance, operations, building their team? Um, and we often try to share best practices between us 
uh, because in the end we're all trying to accomplish the same goal, which is to help our clients uh, achieve their goals. You, uh, it, before you established the, the office in Hopkinton, you, you must, must have surveyed Eastern Massachusetts, <laughs> the 495 <laughs> corridor. What was, t tell me about that process, and then I'd, I'd really like to know why you uh, ended up in, uh, in Hopkinton. Yeah, it's, it's a great question and probably a funny story. <laughs> you know, Greg and I were originally thinking of, of buying a building versus leasing. Uh, our goal was to buy a piece of property, to, uh, to build some equity in it over time and run the business out of it. So uh, we were at lunch one day and I said, uh, Greg, does it make sense to have something relatively close to where we used to be in that Framingham Natick area? So we found a, a piece of property over on 85 across from the post office here in town. And uh, I'm trying okay. to remember what that was, but I remember I pictures know. of planes or right. engines on the wall, and it was almost a three-box setup going, going back off right. the street. Right. Right. And so we went over on our lunch one day and took a look at that property, and, um, <laughs> and it wasn't a good fit for us. <laughs> we found out very quickly. But I used to get off 495 every day at 21B and go right past Price Chopper and up the hill. I lived in Northbridge for several years before moving here to town. And I used to pass what is now Hopkinton Square. So when we went to look at that building that was for sale, uh, the realtor who was representing the seller, I said to him, this isn't going to be a great fit for us, but do you know anything about Hopkinton Square? And he introduced himself as one of the developers of Hopkinton Square. And we went over there. Uh, and Greg and I just thought it was a great fit for us location-wise, parking-wise, being right off 495. Um, and ultimately, that's how we started the conversation about a first build-out. And, uh, and when we went to see the space, uh, you know, we, we learned quickly uh, that we were going to have to build out the space and, and, uh, and put it in a position for our clients to be there and for us to run our business. Location, was that important? It was. Uh, working in the, the Metro West area, uh, we had built up uh, a number of clients in that area. So when Jim and I were exploring where it might be a, a convenient location for both he and I from a commute standpoint, but as well as our clients, something that was easily accessible, Jim alluded to, but uh, plenty of parking, Hopkinton just seemed to be a natural fit. I live in Franklin. It's a 15-minute ride here. Jim, who is now in, in Hopkinton, has a much better commute of, of less than five minutes. But each of our clients that we're fortunate enough to work with that live in the the Whalens, Westons, uh, Littletons, Franklins of the world find it very accessible to get to Hopkinton. So it, it was a very good fit. The, um, your client base, you, you mentioned some of them. How far north and then how far south? Uh, north, well, New Hampshire, west, California, yep. <laughs> south, Florida. Florida. <laughs> but, m most of our clients are in New England, yes. I would say, but we are licensed in several states. Um, ironically, last year I, I took a trip down to uh, Vero Beach, and uh, we have four clients down there and had an opportunity to sit down face to face with them, have lunch, um, have an opportunity to, to visit with them, which is one of the great fortunes of, of having our independence and having mm. that work life balance. We mm. can go see our clients or they can, they can come and see us. Uh, you both um, alluded to uh, activity uh, in the community. Um, and I know you're both interested in that, but tell me, t tell me why, and then give me a, a, a sample of the kinds of things that you, you spend your free time on. Sure, <laughs> sure. So I think, you know, one of the things that aligns with both of us is our, our values. And we go to work every day trying to make a positive impact in the lives of our clients. So it's just as important for us to do that here in the community. So early when we moved into town, we started reaching out to people just to find out different organizations that were in town, how we could get involved, where can we make a positive impact. Um, we learned about Project Just Because. We learned about mm. the Hopkinton Middle School's Courtyard Project. Mm. Uh, we learned about the Hopkinton Center for the Arts. Um, we learned about you know coaching and helping out here in town. Um, so little by little, we, we've learned and gotten involved in several of those areas, and, and it's, it's great. It allows us to uh, to make a positive impact and we've started an annual scholarship fund and we're in the process of going through those applications right now. The, the, the scholarship fund for? For a Hopkinton High School senior. Really? Um, 
so that's uh, that's great. We reached out early to um, to Dr. McLeod to express our desire to uh, put a scholar annual scholarship program in place, and they were great in terms of uh, helping us understand the process and what we needed to do. So Are the uh, is, is the scholarship uh, narrowly defined, or is it? It is. So uh, Jim and I were both raised uh, in single family homes. So uh, I was raised by my mom. Uh, I was the oldest of three and Jim was raised by his dad. So when we decided to put this scholarship into, into action, uh, the criteria was uh, a student who will be going off to college was raised in a single family home. Oh wow. So that, that's the criteria and as Jim alluded to, we're, we're working through those essays and hope to make a determination. How soon. many, how many uh, students applied? I would say somewhere between 12 and 15, 15. on this round. This is our first round. And they, what, what do they have to do yep. to apply? What's the, what's the process? Yep, so obviously uh, they go through the, the process of being accepted into a college or university. Uh, we're having them uh, write an essay about what it's been like being raised in a single family home. How has it shaped you? What it lessons has it taught you? How to handle uh, certain challenges and obstacles? And, uh, and that was really the criteria uh, for them and obviously financial need. So that you bring you bring in financial need. Well, good for you guys. That's a, that's it's a thoughtful way of of, uh, of doing a scholarship. So good for you. Thank you. In terms of uh, you've been in town now for the the operation has been here how long? We just started our fourth year, Tim. Okay. If you you've been here four years now, you got a feel for the community. Uh, let me put you on the spot and uh, in, in, and ask. Um, how could Hopkinton be a better place to do business? If you could, if, 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 there, are, if there are elements out there, uh, how could the community support what you're doing? How could the, can the community be doing a better job in supporting uh, small business, for example? You know, you, you're, you're headquartered in a, a, a pretty interesting spot in Hopkinton. Uh, you know, I'm sure there, there are people um, I lived through that process of, uh, of uh, citing uh, Price Chopper there, mm. but Price Chopper is doing pretty well. Their numbers are, are pretty high, and people people come from around the area, but and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Is there anything anything that that um, we could be doing better as a community? Well, I, I think it's a great question, Tim, and I think part of it starts with collaboration. So, as I as we came into town, it's okay. How do we communicate with those people who have already been in town who may be in our shoes already they're already business owners and understand uh, what they've gone through what's important to them what their concerns are um, and and how they've been able to achieve various goals over the years here in Hopkinton and so we can learn from that and we can share our goals and concerns and and ultimately uh, work together so I think uh, one of the things that that was challenging for us when we first came in was uh, not necessarily knowing who to reach out to um, or where to go to, to get that information. But you know your, your involvement in the, in the community and in, in the, the projects that you picked, they're pretty good. Yeah. Uh, they, they, you, you tapped in pretty quickly to some, uh, some interesting organizations and interesting, uh, interesting projects. And I'm, 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 my hope is that you can obviously continue to do that. That's an important thing. How about you, yeah. Hopkinton? <laughs> Just let's focus on Hopkinton. How do we make it better? How do we make it better? If it, and, and maybe we don't. Maybe yeah. it's great just the way it is. Yeah, it's not living in the town. Uh, Jim is fortunate to live here and knows a little more about the dynamics. Uh, for us, I was, Hopkinton's been, uh, been a great fit for our business, our location, uh, for our clients. Uh, I don't know how much more that the town itself could do for us. Uh, we experience most of our growth organically through our, our clients. Uh, we're very fortunate that uh, we have a loyal base and they often refer, refer friends or family to us. Uh, we've done what we can, as Jim had alluded to, and you have regarding the, the philanthropic efforts within yeah. the community. Uh, we do a little more uh, by advertising in the independent, really just to establish our brand within the community. Um, and, you, and you've been a supporter of HCAMP. We have. 
Yeah, we, we've, uh, we, met, uh, we met some of the individuals here at HCAM early in the process, and we believe in what they do and their support of the local community, uh, and we're excited to be able to, to support them and the members of this community. You know, HCAM is, uh, it's, uh, they started out in a very small facility, and they have a, a, a terrific studio. They're doing, they're doing more and more. Uh, they continue to grow their, their outreach in the community in terms of programming, that sort of thing. And they, they do things like Physicians Focus now that, that uh, where they produce a program here, but it's in 200 plus towns and cities in, uh, in the Commonwealth now. It's a pretty, pretty interesting operation. But as I said, this, pr this little half hour moves pretty quick. Yes. Um, I think for me, the exciting part is to uh, be able to talk to two people that one are gentlemen, number one, a lost art in some people's minds, Two, have uh, done the, the kind of research that you've done. And three, the kind of commitment that you're making in, in, uh, to the community. So we really appreciate uh, the opportunity to spend a few minutes with you and wish you continued good luck. Well, thank you, Tim. It's certainly a pleasure to be here today. Yes, thank you. Well, I think you'll agree that uh, both Greg and Jim are a couple of examples of the quality and passion of our local businesses. Uh, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for coming on the show. And thank you for watching this episode of Business Matters to those out in the audience. followed by an open mic with people who come from near and far. Think Jackson Pollock in monochromatic brown. When the owls finally roost and small creatures can safely sleep, I can sleep too. I sang with the master and danced for eternity in the light of the moon. Welcome to Hopkinton Coffee Break. A very special dessert done by a woman from Hopkinton that yes. I've started using regularly. We had your residents participating both as vendors and as shoppers, and that, oh, that was, that was so, so much fun. fun. Uh, Real Hopkinton Housewives, if you're on Facebook, you will have a blast. Thanks for joining Cheers, us. Cheers, guys. It's been a great Thank you. Yeah, good to see you, see too. You guys. Bye.